Good morning. The time is now 9.25. Um, the subject we're discussing today is high available Drupal. Um, so if that's not what you're coming for, then you still have a bit to, to leave. Um, but if you are um, looking for high available Drupal, um, that's um, what we're going to discuss. Let me first let me introduce myself. My name is, is Bram. Uh, or Bram for the English speakers. Um, I used to be a molecular biologist, at least that's what my professors at university told me. Um, I got into uh, big data before big data was a, a thing in the IT world. That's, um, we produce about a million data points per week. That means you have to write code to get through them. So I became a developer. I joined the dark side, as my colleague said, and um, I spent my time developing uh, bioinformatic code. Um, in, academ in an academic world, you're most of the time, when you're the developer, you're the server guy, so I build my, my own academic uh, clusters, which meant I joined the dark side and I became the ops guy. And that's when Inuit, my current employer, picked me up and said, this is the guy you want to work with. So from afar, it looks like a strange step to go, but to me, it was a, a gradual sliding scale. So what we're discussing today is also the ops works about how, what things it would uh, it would take to run Drupal in a uh, in a reliable way. And at Inuit we have a couple of reliability principles. This is the stuff that we teach our developers, our operations guys. What would it take to have confidence in our infrastructure? Not just our infrastructure, but also the actual platforms, the platform, the, the infrastructure, the code, the monitoring, uh, our processes that uh, are in place or should be in place before we can actually um, reliably uh, serve a product to a customer or serve one of our own products. Um, so now I would like to step you through um, the, the, the several principles that we have come up with. First of all, previous speaker already mentioned it, stake it in a revision system. Um, if it doesn't exist in a revision system, it doesn't exist. If it's in your home there, if it, how well meant it is, it does not exist. You will leave the company, you will go on holiday, um, and then we need to hunt down wherever your script is running from. So we stick it in version control. We have all, which gives us the benefits of version control, which means history, which means blame, which means we can easily diff. Um, some stuff you produce, some artifacts you produce are binary, so then vision systems become more difficult to work out what the actual diff is. Um, but whatever yields the binary artifact will need to be in version control. So if it's not in there, it doesn't exist. And this is a very strict rule we apply to pretty much anything. Um, we deploy artifacts, not code. Um, and this is a very important principle. Um, what we see with a lot of customers or beginning teams is that they would want to go to your prod system, SSH into it, CD into it, the directory, and then do a git pull. Um, this is dangerous because you will never, never, ever know if your process will uh, succeed until you try and do it. And this is uh, too dangerous on a production system. Um, so we will actually have a promotable artifact. This is, we'll have a, a pipeline, we'll have a process where we create the artifact. In our case, we like to package as, as a native um, package. So when we're a central shop or Red Hat shop, so we, we produce mostly RPMs. Um, which brings another benefit to our system, because RPMs or any built-in package manager is how you basically stand on the shoulders of giants. It's been, they've been around for literally decades, since the beginning of, of operating systems. Um, you, they'll give you the benefit of history. They will give you the benefit of um, known version updates or upgrades or downgrades, dependency management. It's all built in. You don't have to reinvent it yourself. Um, and the other benefit most of the time is um, all more most package managers, uh, native package managers I know of, will have a feature that will tell you what package provided what file, or even if your file has been changed on disk since the since the uh, installation has taken place. 
uh, this doesn't only, not only f does it find uh, colleagues that helped out on production by fixing something, um, it also will help you track down uh, hackers. They will, um, on more than one occasion, while we were brought in to find a attack vector, we basically look at what files have changed on this. It's as simple as that. Um, if it looks like something that we shouldn't have changed, then probably someone else did. Um, if you automate the things like a previous speaker already mentioned, when you have a pipeline, building an RPM out of something is, is only a simple step. Um, I believe the official Debian packaging guideline is about 800 pages, and there are tools out there that will, that'll basically make it a one-liner. Um, tool called FPM, which we use, we use heavily. It won't yield you packages that will directly be allowed into Debian or uh, CentOS, but it's, it works just fine. Um, the other reason, um, when we're on the subject of, um, of artifacts, we only create artifacts based on resources we have in-house. Another strict rule we apply. Um, and the first one is a bit of a, a, a teaser. Did I mention angry upstream developers? Uh, developers did. Most uh, language uh, environment, uh, ecosystems have had um, have a central package of, uh, package repository, think Ruby gems, think Composer in our case, um, where providers or developers have pooled packages that everybody else relied on. Um, if that package goes away, your build will fail. Um, some people will say, meh, um, but if that's the time you want to push out that emergency deploy, you're actually screwed. Um, which means manual intervention. Um, manual interventions. It will also mean um, uh, straying away from the thing you know best, which is your automated pipelines. When you're in a stressful situation, you do want to, you do not want to deviate from your standard patterns, or have a very well scripted uh, deviation. Um, so when we build in house, we we do it because we know we have the tools in-house. Um, we are responsible, um, but also uh, have the opportunity to fix when stuff is broken. When Composer goes down, or RubyGems goes down, or in our case, I don't know, people still around from the early GitHub days, GitHub used to go down a lot on Fridays. Um, people had processes around it, so don't deploy on Friday, which is weird anyway, because if you have enough confidence in your process, you can deploy it at will at any day of the week. Um, also, we work in a lot of corporate environments, and corporate firewalls means that Composer might not be available to you, and will not be made available to you. So you need to have something in-house. In our case, we, uh, it's a combination of Pulp, which is the RPM, um, the open source pa uh, RPM package uh, repository, and Nexus. Uh, other tools are available, like Artifactory, which is actually better, but not. Um, it comes with a heavy uh, license fee. Um, so build in house. Um, and this is something that our, our junior developers and engineers actually struggle with. Um, your composer log files, if it have, we actually have a built in check. If your composer log file has a github.com URL in there, we, we will fail your build. Um, because we have a Nexus set up with a, with a built-in proxy. Um, this still will give you, might give you problems if Composer isn't available at the moment the developer wants it, but that's a reduced risk already from what we, we started with. Um, the only way to get to prod is pipelines. Um, this is an example of a Jenkins workflow. It's one of the newer vi uh, visualization tools. Um, we have a multi-step process, same as the previous speaker. The only way to know if it works is building and deploying not into production first. And for the people that look uh, closely, we have nice names for our, our environments. We do, not, uh, we do not call them dev, UET, prod. We have names like practice, theory, uh, reality. 
because if it works in theory, then we can deploy to production. Uh, we will have multiple uh, production. Um, this is also something people struggle with. Um, for instance, our demo site will be launched before um, the general release. And then normally people get into trouble, but it's not production fully, So, but it's not UVT, because on UVT we actually run uh, quite destructive uh, field tests, which we don't want customers to see, so we'll have an additional production uh, platform. Um, and this one was important enough for me to put in caps, config does not belong in a package. Um, config has a different release cadence from code. For instance, if I want to change my config on production, I don't want it in the original artifact because then I need to promote it all the way through to production without any benefit to uh, the underlying environments. So how we actually deploy this will come, we'll discuss in the next slide. But by separating your config from your code, you will also have built-in opportunities to do canary testing, so you have A-B testing. Um, and also have a deploy and feature switch. So as you make it a two-step two process. Deploy your code, deploy your config. When you're ready to toggle feature X, you deploy a new config. And this is much quicker than doing full deploys. Full deploys um, will take bigger, bigger artifacts, will take longer to uh, propagate through your network, where config is mostly text files. So it's KBs versus MBs, or even gigabytes at some point, if you deploy a uh, Java code. So we use config management for all the things, um, otherwise known as infrastructure as code. Uh, our, our poison of choice is Puppet. Um, this allows us to also not only model code, but model our infrastructure like it were code. Um, it also allows, because it is now code, we can have all the benefits from code. So we can stick it in a version control. We can test it. We can, we can actually version it. So it's not at git hash x. But at any given point, we actually know which version we're, we're uh, modeling our software with. And this also allows us to have environments for infrastructure. And this is actually an L-shaped profile. So we have a production pipeline that will go to prod. And our prod code is actually deployed for dev, for UVT, for prod for the, the platform itself. So we can develop Apache code, uh, pro HAProxy MySQL settings, without actually interfering the active development trying to get to production. Um, and measure all the things. So monitoring is not a hindsight, is not an afterthought, because the next phase of this presentation will go into stuff we actually saw from our monitoring. Um, so do not accept like no budget, no time, it's built in. This is part of the work you're actually trying to do. Um, and the last one actually should also be been in, in caps. We tell customers we do not go to prod if we do not have meaningful logs, methods, <coughs> and alerts. Because if you pay me to wake up in the middle of the night, and I only want to be woken up by stuff I can actually fix. It needs to be actionable. By meaning actionable, that means I know what it is, I know uh, how to fix it, and it actually needs to be fixed right now. Um, and actually, this should be the obvious one. If you want to be reliable, if you want to be able to survive catastrophic failure, and needs to be more than one. Um, this is an obvious conversation to have, but not always obvious how to fix it. And N plus one, does that mean it needs, in our case, we run everything on our own hypervisors, it needs to be on a different hypervisor. But does it also need to be in a different rec? Um, does it need to be in a different DC? Inter DC will give you a weird latency problem. Does the customer actually want to pay to run the, at the other DC at a different supplier? They don't go backward too often, but we've had one customer where their entire supplier went offline quite dramatically, quite quickly. So they actually now pay us to have it run at two suppliers, which means two times your, your, um, your processes. And we try to keep them as close as possible. Um, and then at the end, it actually is a conversation about with your customer what they're willing to pay for. 
how resilient do you want to be, what kind of level of cast uh, catastrophic uh, event do you want to be able to survive. Um, banks want to be always online, you know, websites running cat, for, uh, cat movies are not going to care if the, um, the Netherlands will flood. Um, so in our case, the simple summary is a working service is an automated uh, combination of our application code, our infrastructure code, and the availability of monitoring. So now that we've built up to uh, um, our, uh, what are the principles, we're actually going to discuss the surviving the herds. So this is our, our basic setup. Uh, we have somewhere on the internet that connects to our virtual IP. There's a two HA proxies in two different data centers that cross-connect to Apache's where our Drupal actually runs. We should then cross-connect via virtual IP to our MySQLs and we have a shared storage on, on cluster. Um, and we're going to build our way back from right to left. So first of all, shared storage. Um, probably obvious, but... Um, Drupal can generate a lot of small files quite quickly, and that basically will kill your, your shared storage. Um, so please tweak for small files. Um, the other problem we had was Drupal. Uh, so we were originally Symfony Shop. Before that, we were Drupal. We were moving back into Drupal. So um, we, we came to a lot of surprises. Um, when Twig writes out the cache, it has a unique cache identifier. If you have two instances of Drupal writing in the same directory, um, during a deploy, the hash key will probably most likely change. So one, um, <coughs> one node will actually be clearing the cache while the other one uh, tries to fill it, and uh, that will, will get you into race conditions quite quickly. So when you do this, please move your, your, your twig, especially your twig has, move, move it off your shared, um, your shared storage. Um, the other thing we saw was um, Drupal is quite uh, sensitive to geospatial problems. So we had one MySQL cluster, which and two DCs. Two DCs were actually quite far away. One in Germany, one in in uh, in France. Um, when customers were switched from the German customers were switched to the French MySQL, actually the latencies were going up quite quickly. Um, so we now we. Uh, our monitoring actually was fine, and then 95% our response time looked fine. But when we're actually looking at populations within the response time, we actually saw the ones going across uh, countries, and that was slowing down considerably. Um, so now we fixed those. We're basically moving clusters, DCs, closer together. Luckily, we have providers that will we know where they are, and we can basically um, have them opt an optimum distance. Um, which will have problems. Well, if you have a, a, a local catastrophe like a power grid going down, um, you're more likely to have problems. But then you can actually, if your customer is willing to pay for it, you can actually split the plus four data centers into countries. Um, in our case, customers are not really willing to pay for it. Um, master master applications, we use a simple master master, um, which means MySQL uses a uh, staggered increments for primary keys. When you're looking at a table like um, the semaphore, it actually wants unique IDs across uh, all tables. Uh, or unique and the same across all, all databases. Um, we, so we had to put either uh, we code in place that would stay away from semaphore or have reconciliation mechanisms in place. Um, moving your cache actually down to uh, out of the database uh, also help with our, our geospatial problems. Um, for most people that run Drupal, we'll do this naturally, but we have to uh, experience it ourselves. Um, filling cache can actually destroy your database. Um, when you have too many active uh, users. So we moved it into Redis. Um, first, first, we moved it into a local Redis, which gave us, um, which relieved the database, but gave us orchestration problems. You basically have two local caches, so if your customer updates a, an article on one, on one end, and then gets routed to the second node, um, they actually don't see your cha their changes. Um, so we ha first, we have a uh, we quickly moved to a failover system where basically one is primary and we only flip over when the primary goes down. But that's not HA, that's failover. Um, so now we have um, orchestration tools in place, code in place, that will actually flush the cache on two sides. 
Um, then composer optimizations. Composer, we, we were a PHP shop, we knew composer, can, the way it builds up its class map can be optimized. Um, it's, it's a process called authorized um, authoritative class map, which basically um, disallows uh, PHP autoloading to walk through all your trees of code. It actually builds one authoritative file, um, which feels counterintuitive, but it's a big um, key value pair, basically, class, location. Um, we've had problems with Drupal accepting this because um, some places will produce proxy classes which are not automatically uh, put into your composer file. So you have to manually or semi-automatically go through your, your tree and basically add those to the, uh, to the class map. Um, post install. Um, most deploys are, because we use RPMs, they're, they're almost atomic, but then we allow uh, developers to write their own scripts we call post and install scripts, and basically this is what Josh happened. And we found that they wrote tasks that on their laptop with a small data set would take seconds, but on the back, the big data set will take, take minutes, so we, um, we aggressively review and refactor those where we basically, anything that can be happen in the pipeline will happen there, uh, even though it sometimes takes longer or is a bit annoying to build uh, stuff like caches. Um, and then we try to work around the, the, the 20 minute deploys. And I think I'm actually already a minute over. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, tomorrow there are more places to collaborate and if you'd like to rate me, here's a link somewhere.